All right. Amen. So you're there in Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Look down at verse number 20. Ecclesiastes 10, look at verse number 20. It says this, Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Um, now, what we're going to be doing for the next several weeks is talking about relationships, uh, more specifically your relational IQ. At the Red Hot Preaching Conference, uh, I preach a sermon about how to properly place people in your life, you know, because we have uh, people that we're friendly with, but they're not necessarily our close friends, you know, and there's certain things that we can and can't trust them with yet. And obviously, you know, we want to build those relationships and turn them into friends. But I think that today we're just too quick to meet people and to let our guards down. And you know, the Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse as you see the day coming. And so we're starting to see that, you know, we're seeing that people, you know, are no longer adhering to selfless service. People are being extremely selfish uh, with their conversation, just with everything in life. And so we need to know how to navigate um, in life because of that. Now, the title of my sermon is, Can They Keep Their Traps Shut? Can They Keep Their Traps Shut? And like I said, the topic is basically discipline in conversation. So who in here, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'll bet everybody in here has told somebody something and they went and told someone else. And you're kind of left like, whoa, wait a second. I thought we had something here, right? I thought that you were gonna keep that to yourself, but yet they went around and told other people. You know, maybe it was a big deal. Maybe it was kind of a big deal, or maybe it really wasn't, but you're still kind of like thinking like, well, why did you go and tell that other person? Why does that happen? We're going to talk about that today. We're going to learn how to deal with personal information. So who we should share these things with and who we shouldn't. Now, I, I had this happen to me recently and I, I'm, I'm kind of glad that it did, but I was talking with somebody about a person in another church that's a problem. And I don't necessarily trust this guy, but you know, a couple weeks later he goes and, and tells this person everything that I said. But I said these things knowing full well that he was gonna do that or capable of doing that, and I'm glad that he did. But it just kinda goes to show you, when you understand how this works, when you understand who you can trust with information and who you can't, it's actually a powerful tool. You know, and that doesn't mean that we have to hate these people or that we have to, you know, put them in the frenemy category, if you will. But it does kind of help you to understand, you know, is this somebody that I can trust? Is this somebody that I can tell personal information with? Because when we learn things, especially about other people, there's like this burning desire, right? You just want to tell somebody that, you know, when so, like, like, for example, you know, when, uh, when somebody uh, finds out, oh, you know, I'm pregnant, right? and they want to keep it a secret for a little bit, it could be hard for you to keep that a secret, right? Victor's shaking his head, he's like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, why do we have that burning, basically? And, and we're, we're going to talk about that. Now, going back to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20. So we're going to talk about what this means in its basic context, like what it actually is referring to. And then what we're going to do for the sermon is we're going to break it down into three metaphorical points. I'm going to show you how that's going to help us to protect personal information. Uh, so keep your place there in chapter number 10, but go to second Kings chapter number six, second Kings chapter number six, second Kings chapter number six. And so, you know, another trap that, uh, that I become aware of over the last few years is that when you're talking with somebody, especially somebody that knew that you've just met, you know, there could be like this awkward silence that happens, right? And your mind will start racing to try to fill that silence, to try to fill that gap. And you got to be careful with what you say in that time frame because you could wind up snaring yourself. You know, and you say, well, I've, I've shared things I shouldn't have and it never got back to me. Well, praise God, because you just happen to probably be talking to somebody that has discipline that actually isn't going to go run off and do those sorts of things. So I'm going to show you an example of this um, here in Second Kings chapter number six. So just to, to set the context of what's going on in this time frame, the nation of Israel is divided. OK, so you have the southern kingdom of Judah and you have the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah has a king and his name is Jehoshaphat. And if you uh, have read these stories or if you're familiar with this, uh, Jehoshaphat was friends with a wicked king of Israel named Ahab. Well, after Ahab, his son takes over and his son's name is Jehoram. And the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 3 that he put away the image of Baal, but he's still clang on to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And if you remember what those sins were, basically Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, what he did 
after Israel split into two is he set up golden calves, one in Dan, one in Beersheba. And so the people decided, well, that's my new religion. It worked for, you know, Aaron back in the day. It's good to go. So he still was uh, guilty of doing those sins, but he wasn't quite as bad as Ahab. And I bring that up because it's very important here. In chapter number five, we see that uh, Elisha, the prophet, is basically the prophet in Samaria. And uh, the Bible tells us that Syria is a nation that's growing uh, militarily, it's growing economically, and they're starting to become a force to be reckoned with. And there's little skirmishes going on between the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria. And so the Bible says in chapter 5 that in Syria there's a guy by the name of Naaman, right? Naaman the Syrian. And the Bible says that he's basically Syria's general. He's the, the, the top military leader of that day. He's next unto the king. And what happens is he gets word that there's a prophet in Samaria that could heal him of his leprosy that he has. And so he gets word of this. He talks to the king of Syria. And the king of Syria is like, hey, this is great. You know, I'm going to write a letter into Jehoram and, and we'll kind of see where this goes. And, you know, maybe he can help you out. So Jehoram gets the letter and he's like, see, this guy's got beef with me. He's got a problem. He wants to fight me. Right. And Elijah's like, hey, just relax. Just send him to me and I'll take care of it. That way Syria will know that there is a God in heaven. And in chapter number six, a process of time has gone by, and now Syria is getting ready to make war with Israel. And so what they do is they're setting up ambushes, okay? So Syria is setting up ambushes, but every single time Israel is able to figure out where these ambushes are, and they're able to escape. And so what you're seeing here is that there's a leak of information. So the king of Syria, he keeps telling his servants, okay, we're going to set an ambush up over here. And then that falls through. And so he's trying to figure out like, what in the world is going on? How do people keep finding out what I'm talking about? And he's like, aren't you guys going to deliver up this person that keeps telling all the secret information? And let's pick the story up here in verse number eight. So second Kings six, eight, it says this. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, now that would be Elisha, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Verse number 10. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once nor twice. So this isn't just a one-time thing. This keeps happening. And the king of Syria is just super frustrated here. He doesn't know what to do. Look at verse 11. It says this, therefore, so for that reason, for the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, will ye not show me? which of us is for the king of Israel, right? And who's ever been in that position before? You know, you keep telling somebody something, you're like, all right, who is giving away the secrets here, right? Who is just, just can't keep the trap shut. Now here's the key in verse number 12. So remember the verse that we opened up with, because we're going to connect them here. Look at verse number 12. And one of his servants said, none, my Lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel, the words that thou speakest in thy bed chamber. You see that? It's just like Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, right? Go back there real quick and look at it again. What, what does Solomon tell us here in chapter 10? Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. So what are the servants of the king of Syria saying to him? They're basically saying, hey, because God wants your secrets to be made manifest, there's nothing that you can do about it. And that's the, that is what this verse means here in Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, verse 20. And it's really the bottom line for my sermon, and it's this. A few people you meet in life keep information confidential, but if God wants it to be known, it's going to be known. And that's what this verse is saying here. When we develop this wicked attitude towards people that don't deserve it, you know, and it just keeps festering and it keeps festering. God's saying, hey, that information is going to get out. So when you don't like your boss, when, you know, husband and wife have a problem with each other, or you have a problem, you know, with some kind of an authority figure, God's basically saying you got to be careful because that information is going to leak out. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, how? What if I don't tell anybody? It doesn't matter. If God wants that information to be known, it's going to be known. No one can keep secrets from God. It's impossible. The Bible says you can be sure that your sin will find you out. Now, 
I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. And so I think that the, this, this whole sermon that I'm preaching this morning really can be summed up into the sentence. A few people that you meet in life can keep information confidential, but if God wants it to be known, it's going to be known. You know, and I think when we can really buckle down and just understand that, you know, I think it's going to save us a lot of pain, save us a lot of heartache, and actually help us to maintain and grow good relationships with other people. Because look, in these days, we need each other. We need as many people on fire for the Lord as possible. We don't need people getting offended. We don't need people just getting all upset over things that don't matter, things that could have been prevented because there are souls dying every single day and going to hell. Right. And like we've been talking about on Wednesdays, you know, there are very few people left on this planet that even want, that even have the desire to go and preach the gospel to the lost, right? And when we as God's people sit here and we fight each other because we don't understand how to operate in relationships, it is nothing but a catastrophe. So what we're going to do now is we're going to break this verse down into three parts, okay? Metaphorically speaking. So the first part of the verse that we read says, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought. And again, you know, when I was younger and I'd read this, I'd be like, man, what is he talking about there? Like, how does that get out? Well, now you've seen an example of that. If God wants your secrets out, guess what? They're coming out. There's nothing in the world that you can do about that. But really, this is going to serve well for our first point, which is this, your thoughts about people leak out. Okay, your thoughts about other people leak out, and you're like, well, how? How is this even possible? Well, you're there in Proverbs chapter number 23. Uh, let's see here. Look at verse number 6. Look at verse number 6. It says this, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. So what is this saying here? This is basically saying when you understand that someone is evil, that someone is all about hurting other people, right? Whether it be through evil communications or through their actions, whatever it is, you have to be careful, even when they're nice to you. Don't fall for the trap. Oh, well, well they like me. They just don't like everybody else. You've got to be very careful because the next verse is going to set it straight for us. Look at what it says. Verse number seven, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. It says in the beginning of that verse, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so going back to point number one, your thoughts about people leak out. I say this all the time because it's so true. And I think that if you understand this, it's going to save you a lot of pain. And that's this. The majority of your thoughts lead to the majority of your actions. So when someone is in your head, they're living in your head and you can't get it out. Guess what? It's going to come out through nonverbal communication. It's going to come out in your actions. It's going to come out in the subtle jabs that you take about people. And these are things that you need to understand. You need to recognize because we need to know who's on our side. We've had a lot of people come inside of this church and they seem like they're good people. They seem like they're Christian. They seem like they're saved. They seem like they love the Lord. But then yet when you go out and you take them soul winning, right? And they get around other people that don't know any better then the heresy starts to come out. They start to tell people at the door all kinds of weird things that we don't even believe. We had a guy in here going around trying to sow seeds that we believe in aliens and all this crazy flat earth garbage. I mean, you are out of your mind, but this stuff happens all the time. But when we understand how this works, when we understand the types of people that just are consumed with other people, they just want to pit each other, you know, against each other, you can learn how to properly place those people in your life so they don't damage you, they don't damage your family, and they don't get people in here frustrated to the point to where they just want to get bitter and leave, okay? So, you can leave your place there. Now go to 2 Samuel chapter number 13. 2 Samuel chapter number 13. We'll take a look at an example of this nonverbal communication here. Um, <clears throat> but here's another one. You know, my wife, Jessica, she gets migraines a lot. And she's had them forever, ever since we've, you know, been married. And various things cause those migraines for her. And, um, you know, it can be very debilitating. And because of her experience with these migraines, a lot of times, you know, you know, she'll have one for about six, seven hours. And I won't even be able to really tell. Like, I'll know something's off, but she can hide it. But eventually the pain is just so much that it starts to come out in nonverbal communication. She doesn't maybe walk as fast. She gets kind of snappy. She gets kind of, you know, gets a little, a little angry and, and, and rightfully so. And you say, well, why are you bringing this up? And that's because point number one, your thoughts about people leak out. Your thoughts about other things, they just come out nonverbally. We, you know, we ought to not be so shallow. We think that, well, you know, if, if they didn't say they don't like me, then obviously I just got to take it, you know, that they do. No, you need to understand that communication is not just verbal. That's what I'm trying to say here. So 
example of this, 2 Samuel chapter number 13. Um, we've talked about this a little bit lately. We're going to talk about it more because it's just the story is deep. And this is not a very pleasant story in the Bible, okay? But it is the Word of God and it has to be preached. So in this chapter here, it's the story of Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom, okay? And so just to give you a quick rundown, they're all King David's children, but Amnon and Tamar um, are half siblings. So Tamar is the half sibling to Amnon. Okay. And so what's going on here is he has a, uh, disgusting lust for his sister. Okay. That's, that's what's going on here. He develops these feelings for her and he goes and tells somebody who he thinks is his friend. This guy's name is Jeho uh, Jonadab. And Jonadab basically gives him this advice on what to do. He says, just go ahead and feign yourself to be sick, call your sister to come in, have her bake you some bread, and then everything's going to happen the way that you want to. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what happens. So after um, Amnon forces Tamar, obviously he, he hates her. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But um, what, what happens after he realizes, oh, wait a second, this is not how I envisioned this in my head. He kicks his half sister out. She's distraught. She's like, you know, you, you telling me to leave now is worse than what you just did to me. This is horrible. And so what he does is he calls his servants into the room and says, Hey, bolt the door so that she can't come back. She rents her clothing and she runs out of the house. Okay. So at that point, she's running away here. Now, keep in mind, we're going to learn about Absalom here. Absalom is Tamar's brother and David's uh, son also. Remember, David had a lot of wives, a lot of concubines, a big family, a big family. And um, he notices uh, Tamar running out of the house. Now, look what he says here. This is very important. 2 Samuel 13, look at verse number 20. It says this, And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister, he is thy brother, regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Now there's obviously a lot wrong with what Absalom said, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But what I want you to pay attention to is the beginning of this verse here, where it says, And Absalom her brother said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? Now if you're familiar with the entire story, Amnon was not trying to advertise his feelings for Tamar. Right? The only person that he told was Jonadab, his friend. That, the Bible makes it very clear when you read chapter number 13. And he did not want anybody else to know. And obviously, you know, for obvious reasons, right? And so you say, well, what's the big deal here? Well, how did Absalom see her running out, knowing that there's also servants in there? Why did his mind automatically go to Amnon? Think about that. Why? Why did he say, wait a second, has Amnon and thy brother been with thee? Obviously, because she had been on Amnon's mind and on his heart for a very long time, he was giving nonverbal communications. He was probably sending signals that he himself didn't even recognize. But yet somehow Absalom was able to pick those up and understood. He was able to put two and two together real quick when he saw his sister running out of that house. I was like, oh, okay. Right. And then, so you have to understand that the majority of your thoughts lead to the majority of your actions. So when someone is in your head, you need to realize that's going to come out. So if you don't want that information out, I'm going to show you exactly what you need to do here to keep that from happening. Because look, I mean, that's a battle in itself, right? You know, when someone is on your nerves, like they're literally on your nerves, they're in your body, you're thinking about them constantly and you just can't get it out. Now go to Romans chapter number 12. I'm going to show you uh, a good tip here on how to overcome this, what to do to stop this from happening, because this could be like pulling teeth. I, look, for me personally, when someone's on my nerves, and, and a lot of you who have been around here for a while, you know, I, after the service is over, I'm like, can you believe this? You know, what so-and-so did? Can you believe that email that this guy keeps sending me, those phone calls that we keep getting, you know? It bugs me so much, and it's because I'm human. You know, I got the old man. We all, we all do. We all struggle with this, but here's the deal. Because sometimes people bother us, but they're another brother and sister in Christ, right? You know, like I said at the Red Hot Preaching Conference, you're crazy if you think you're going to get along with everybody in every setting and every organization. It's not going to happen the way that you think. You have to learn how to properly place people in your life, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We are going to do this. Look at Romans chapter 12. Look at verse number 20. It says this, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. 
be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so the application that I want to give you this morning, when you have somebody that's in your head, but you don't want other people to know, and you want to properly manage that, is to develop discipline in your thought life. You need to develop a plan for that person. Whether you're going to do something nice for them, you're going to properly put them in their place, you're going to address the situation, but you have to do something. Right, what Amnon should have done is got some counsel from somebody else, yeah. right? He should have just, just, just bit the bullet and just gone and talked to his dad, talked to somebody and said, hey, this is wrong. I know this is wrong. I need help, right? And sometimes when we do that, it's like, okay, you know, now we can actually get the counsel. Now we can actually get the help that we need in order to be successful. But when you don't develop a plan for these types of people in your life, you're setting yourself up for a great failure and you will have conflict. Just knowing that something is being done, it really can get your thought life back into gear and you can develop that maturity that you need to be successful in life. Just, and, and this applies across the board. Now go back if you would to Ecclesiastes chapter number 10 and we're going to move on to the second point. So the first point came from the, uh, the first part of the verse, which says, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought. Now we have a good example of what that means and what to do about it, right? So he says, curse not the king, no, not in thy thought. And we understand that when these people get into our heads, the information is going to come out. You say, well, I'm good. I can keep secrets. Yeah, but you can't keep the nonverbal, especially when you don't have a plan on what to do about these people. This is why fighters, this is why sports teams try to get in each other's heads because it works. It's a good tactic, right? Bradley knows that. It's a good tactic, man. You get in somebody's head and you got the advantage, okay? So let's look at the second part of the verse, which says this, and curse not the rich in thy bed chamber. So metaphorically speaking, what can we pull from this? What does this mean? And you say, okay, I get it. Well, okay, don't curse the rich. Why do we have a temptation to curse the rich? Because the Bible says that they oppress us, okay? That's what they do. They are oppressive people a lot of times, okay? And so when I read this here, it says, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. So understanding point number one, that we've got our thoughts in order. You know, we've got a plan for these people so that they don't dominate us. They don't live in our head. Well, we need to understand the bedchamber. What does that represent? If you're in your bedroom, you know, you're about to take a nap, you're about to go to sleep. It represents relaxation. Okay. That's what it represents. And so my second point is this, you know, our confidential information leaks out because of the casual way that we carry ourselves and view other people. I see this all the time. I see people get together and they don't know each other very well, but yet they've got a couple things in common that it seems like they hit it off. And all of a sudden they start getting a little too personal, a little too fast. And all of a sudden one person's heart's not with you the way you think that other person's heart is. And guess what? They go run around and they tell other people the things that you wanted to keep confidential. Okay. So we need to be careful of this. Turn to Psalm chapter 119, 119. So again, <clears throat> when we're too casual around people, we begin to talk louder. We begin to talk more frequently. We get, uh, basically we get ourselves into trouble because like I said in my sermon at the Red Hot Preaching Conference, you know, those that are close to you that are your real friends, there's some certain qualifications that they need to meet. Are they loyal? And is that loyalty going both ways? And you have to be honest. Are they steadfast? Are they reliable? Do they love at all times? The Bible says a friend loveth at all times. You know, and you need to take these things and really analyze the people that are in your circle and ask yourself, do they meet these criteria? If not, that doesn't mean you automatically give them the boot. It just means maybe the chemistry is not there, or maybe you need to just pour into them a little bit more, maybe do a little bit more investment and see if you're going to get that back. But a real close friendship is where there's reciprocation, where you give and they give back. Okay. And once you understand that, it makes life so much easier and we can stop the bitterness. But what happens oftentimes is we just get too casual with too many people that we don't even know. I've seen people out soul at the door telling like their, their deep secrets. I'm like sitting here, I'm like, hey, stop, man, come on, stop. You know, I'm on the side of the apartment, I'm like, stop, just, shh, come on, man, I'm like, oh, you don't even know this person. I know he's friends with your uncle, but he's going to tell him everything he said, you know? You'd be at, you know, somebody knock on the door and be like, oh, you know my uncle? And I've seen this. You're like, oh yeah, he's on his way to hell. You know, he's this, he's a derby. He don't believe the Bible. And it's like, oh man, you know, he's going to go tell that. And it's going to cause so much trouble in your family. You don't even know this guy, but yet you're he's sitting here just spilling the beans. How you feel about a family member to somebody you just met. 
And then you come in here, I'm all my family is in perils and everybody's against me. And I'm just banging my head off of this pulpit like, man, yeah, you don't even know these people. You're too casual. Psalm 119, look at verse number 10. Psalm 119, look at verse number 10. It says this, With my whole heart have I sought thee. Now pay attention to this. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. See how it says, not, let me not wander from thy commandments. You say, well, what's that? Well, when you see people just kind of wandering around aimlessly, what does that represent? Casual being too casual. Look, I'm telling you this right now, this gets a lot of people upset, but it's true. Every church that gets casual regarding the King James Bible will eventually go off and start using the other versions. Every church that gets too casual in regards to false doctrine, like the like, you know, people say, "Oh, uh, well, I, I just believe you have to turn from your sins to be saved." You know, when a pastor gets too casual on that and starts to let that person become the song leader, let them work in the church, you know, and not check that, guess what? That becomes a problem. And then you start to get too casual with that. And the next thing you know, you have a church that's split. I've been there. I've seen that. I've been to a good, uh, you know, independent, fundamental Baptist church where the pastor was solid on salvation. He was a great soul winner. You know what? But his song leader believed you had to turn from your sins to be saved, <laughs> which is not what the Bible teaches. You know, and they would go back and forth with this. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, he's too casual with that. He should have told that guy, if you're not going to get saved, if you're not going to believe what the Bible actually says, you need to step down. And maybe you just need to come to church for a while until you can get your head on straight. But what happened? Right now, that church is split. You've got half the room that believes that it's like the Bible says, it's for by grace are you saved through faith. And then the other half's just not sure. Like, well, I think you got to turn from your sins, which is impossible, by the way. Yeah. You know, but what happens when you get too casual with things? Guess what? You start wandering from the commandments. The next thing you know, you will fall. You will be in all sorts of trouble that you do not want to find yourself in. And it's the same thing in relationships. When we get too casual with people, guess what? They're going to turn around and rend you every single time. And if it hasn't happened to you, it probably will. If you're not careful, you absolutely need to be careful. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 11. Proverbs chapter number 11. And I was going to tell you, this one here is pretty easy. You say, well, what, what do we do about this? I, I get what you're over here, you know, yelling and ranting about, you know, about being casual. Just be careful. Okay, just be careful and discipline yourself to keep the information to yourself until you have verified that you can trust this person with that information. So don't just go around telling other people things that you don't want other people finding out about, especially if you don't know them. Okay, you know, our friends are like armor, right? Our friends are supposed to be like armor. And so the question is, have you proved them? Right? What did David say when Saul tried to give him the armor that he wasn't familiar with? He says, I can't use this. I have not proved them. I don't know if these are going to work. It's the same thing in relationships. If you haven't proved people, look, there's nothing wrong with doing this. The Bible says that the spiritual judgeth all things. And it seems like every day of the week, every day of the week, if you go soul winning, what, are the, what is the first thing people say? Don't judge. Don't judge. Where are they getting that stuff from? They're getting it by being too casual with the teachings in the culture of this world, which says, don't judge. That's a trap. That's going to destroy your life. You need to know who is on your side. You absolutely have to. And when you get casual with that, you will get destroyed. You will be embarrassed. You will have all sorts of problems and all sorts of issues. So that's the application there. Look at your close friends. Look at your friends as armor have you proved them ask yourself that and if you haven't you know work towards getting them into that position if you can but just realize you can't trust everyone that you meet just because they're nice or even because they're saved because like i said we're all human we have problems we have issues and not understanding that is definitely a huge huge problem so you're there in proverbs chapter 11 so point number two, again, was about being casual. Actually, keep your place there in Proverbs 11. I'm sorry, go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. And we're going to go on here to point number three. Point number three. So Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Let's look at the last part of that verse here, which says this. It says, For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Now, of course, there are birds out there that repeat things. I've been into houses trying to fix appliances before and have had birds that were literally cussing me out. And I'm like, what is this? And the owners think it's just hilarious. 
You know, they're like, oh, he doesn't like you. I'm like, he says that stuff all the time. I'm sure you taught him to say that kind of stuff. Or, oh, yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. We have our friends come over all the time. We just birds just cussing people out, you know. And so people, you can have a tendency to read this and like, man, is, is there a bird that's going to come in my room when I'm thinking these things and actually just, you know, drop a dime on me and just tell on me? But no, obviously, metaphorically speaking, read it again. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. And so point number three is this. Your secrets get out because you lack personnel discernment, right? We've been talking about this all morning because we lack personnel discernment. What does that mean? We don't know how to discern the people that are around us. You know, and again, this goes back to the whole judging concept. Oh, don't judge, don't judge. You have to, right? You do it every single day. If you drove here in a vehicle, you judged whether the light was red or whether the light was green or whether it was flashing yellow or whether or not it was solid yellow and you could make it through the intersection and there were no cops around. Don't tell me you don't judge. Everybody judges. You have to judge righteously, though, the Bible says, Matthew chapter number seven. Now go back to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. So again, metaphorically speaking, it says, and that which hath wings shall carry the matter. Now the Bible talks about certain people that do have wings, believe it or not. You just can't see them. And this is what makes this teaching so difficult. And I want to show you this here of people that have wings and they're invisible. Proverbs 11, look at verse number 13. It says this, a tail bearer revealeth secrets. Stop right there and say, well, what's a tail bear? It's somebody who goes around and gossips about other people. It's somebody who goes around revealing secrets. Somebody who butters up right up to you, you know, gains your trust very quickly because you can't discern what they're doing. And then they go and tell everyone, right? I've been at new jobs before and it never fails. There's always like one or two guys that will get right up to you right away. You know, ask you all these questions, which makes us feel good, right? Because everybody loves to talk about themselves. Nothing wrong with that, right? But what happens is they're doing that to get you to drop your guard. And as soon as you do and you start talking about different things, they're going to use those words against you. Because there's always people in the workplace that are trying to get ahead based off of false information. Because they don't want to actually go out and work hard and be quiet and understand the promotion comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from you yourself, right? Most of the people in the world, they don't understand that. They don't even believe that. So what they do is they'll go and talk to you and say, hey man, you know, so-and-so is kind of odd. And you know, when I first met this person, when I first started working here, I just thought they were kind of weird. As soon as you say, oh yeah, they got it. They've got you in a trap and you are going down. They're going to go tell the boss. They're going to go tell the team leader. They're going to tell everyone around you. And you are going to find yourself in a world of hurt being the new person. So all I'm trying to tell you is a tailbone reveal the secrets. If you have not proved your friends, don't give the information away. So verse 13 again, a tail bearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit, uh, spirit concealeth the matter. Right? So, I mean, understand this here, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. This is our goal. This is how we want to be. Even though other people have heard us, we want to be of a faithful spirit. We want to be the type of people that, that, uh, that can trust us. Right? You know, and, and oftentimes, you know, when you're out there sowing and someone's pouring their heart and their whole life story into you, you know, you guys know darn well, you want to keep that to yourselves or you want to put that on a prayer list, whether it be uh, unspoken or, or, or even, or even spoken, but you want to verify that 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 person wants that information in front of other people, right? Because we want to be of a faithful spirit. We want to be a people that others can trust so that we can disciple them, right? So we can help them out because that's another part of what we do. Go one chapter over to uh, Proverbs chapter number 12. Proverbs chapter number 12. Another little bit of information here about people that have wings. So we see the tail bearers have wings. The problem again is you just can't see them. You got to learn their tactics. You have to learn what they do. Proverbs 12, look at verse number 13. It says this, the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. So you say, what does this mean? The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. You have to pay attention to the way that people talk. What is transgression? It's sin. So again, let's put you back out in the world for a second. You're out working, you're in your, you're, 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 either your family that, that doesn't believe in God, or maybe they're just kind of loose about these things. You know, when the majority of their words are transgressions and their sins, you can't trust them. Okay. You just can't trust them. You have to be careful because they haven't learned yet to be of a faithful spirit. Look, if someone's not of a faithful spirit, they're probably not going to conceal your information. And you need to realize that and understand who is with you and who is against you. Go one, uh, go, go to uh, Proverbs chapter 20. 
Proverbs chapter number 20. So this is a sign. The Bible says the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. And this is pretty easy in today's day and age, I think, in the workforce to find out. Because you just go into any kind of store and start dealing with people, what comes out of their mouth? Blasphemy, yep. pride, yeah. arrogancy, yeah. right? And just know, okay, I, I, I need to be careful in this situation here. Proverbs 12, look at verse number 19. It says this, He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Again, you're going to find this a lot in the Bible. Why? Because God wants us to have the wisdom to operate on this planet and to just realize, guess what? These talebearers, they've got wings. They're going to go out and they're going to tell everybody everything that you're planning, everything that you're doing, if you're not careful. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, look at this, metal not with him that flattereth with his lips. Look, going back to human nature, right? I read this book and it was part of our spiritual leadership class at Verity. It was called How to Win and Influence People. And one of the things that they said in that book there, they keep mentioning over and over again, is that people love to talk about themselves. And this is just so true, right? But one of the ways that you, you, you get to basically get people to like you is to learn their names and, and, and to, to be friendly. And, and, and that's biblical, right? The Bible says that if you want friends, you have to show yourself to be friendly. But what the Bible's saying here, and kind of what the book hints towards, when you flatter somebody... You know, if that person doesn't have discernment, they're going to drop their guard every single time, right? There's somebody in my life that, that, that doesn't know me very well at all, but yet this person is constantly, constantly flattering me. Just all the time, you're the greatest, you're the best, blah, blah, blah. And, and nothing has happened yet, but I'm just waiting, right? I've set the timer, I've set the clock. I know that that is a dangerous person. And the Bible says, meddle not with him that flattereth with the lips. So when you, and this is especially uh, important for you young people. You know, when the person of the opposite sex comes up to you and they start flattering you right away, be careful. I'll, look, I'm not saying, oh, but are you trying to stop me from getting married? I'm not trying to stop you from doing anything. I'm just trying to tell you, be careful with people that flatter you, that are just overly complimentative because they have a dagger behind their back. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this play out in church, how many times I've seen this play out in the workforce, how many times I've seen this play out in my extended family. When people flatter you, you need to get ready. You need to get your guard right up because they have an agenda. And guess what? That agenda is not good. They are tail bearers more than likely. They're going to they're gonna put them wings at full speed and they're going to run around and just get you. And they're going to tattle and they're going to tell on you. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay, this is a harsh reality, but it's the truth. Meddle not with them. That means don't get too close to them. Put them in their proper place. Put them in that frenemy category where they're not quite an enemy, but they're definitely not a friendly. Okay. <laughs> All right, go to Jude. Go to Jude. We're getting close to being done here. Go to Jude. We're going to take a look here at verse number 16. Just, so just some more tips here on how to recognize these people. Because again, what are we doing? Well, we're looking at the last verse of Ecclesiastes 10, which says, or the last part of that verse, which says, For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Okay, we're looking at people that have wings. It will reveal your secrets, the information you want kept private. Jude 1, verse 16, look what it says. It says, these, talking about these evil people, okay? It says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Now look at this here. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. Let's see, what in the world does that mean? Great swelling words. What are those? What that is, those are loaded words, okay? And it's something you have to pay attention to. Now, I'm not against using big words, you know, especially as a preacher sometimes, I'm like trying to find different words to explain points and explain concepts, you know, but there are some people that naturally pick this up and you'll notice this, especially about false prophets, right? False prophets, I don't know if you know this, but they can speak very well, very well. I'm serious. Like you take all these independent fundamental Baptist preachers and you put them up against, you know, guys like Joel Osteen, you know, even, even the, these women preachers that are out here, they can speak better than all of us. I'm serious. Like, like they can communicate. They do a good job. But the problem is it's not always what they're saying in words, right? It's the emotion that they're sowing in those words. 
okay? That's what a loaded word is. So when it says here in verse 16 that they speak great swelling words, this is what talebearers will do to get you to drop your guard. They'll start to speak great swelling words. So they'll speak a word to you that has emotion behind it. And you need to learn to recognize this. Let me just read this definition for you about loaded words. It says this, because this is what great swelling words are in, in, in the modern dictionary, a loaded word. It says this, a loaded word is chosen because a speaker or writer believes it'll be more persuasive than an alternate neutral word. These words appeal to emotion. And so I just co uh, copied and pasted just, just some, some examples. And there's nothing wrong with using these words, okay? But you just need to recognize when people are using them on you <laughs> so that you don't get in trouble, so that you don't get hurt. So here's some examples. So people might use the word aggravate versus annoy. Demonization versus criticism. Displeased versus unhappy. Dreadful versus bad. Effective versus good. Eliminate versus remove. Elitist versus expert, okay? And when you kind of meditate and you kind of dwell on that, like why would somebody say elitist versus expert, right? Well, because some people are, for example, trained, right? Like I, I went through training obviously before I, I became a pastor. I didn't go to Bible college. I don't believe you need to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to be able to preach the word of God. I think you can do it just fine by having the Holy Ghost and studying and praying and meditating on these things and, and having paid attention in church for years and actually applying knowledge to wisdom. But what I've had happen to me is people think, oh, you know, you've got this elitist position. Like, they'll say stuff like that to me. And I sit and think, like, okay, that's a loaded word. That's a great swelling word. That was spoken to me to resonate and to try to get me upset later on in the day. You get what I'm trying to say here? They'll speak these great swelling words. So it's like leaven, right? It's just a little bit of powder, but yet when you put it in a glass full of water and sugar, what's going to happen? It's going to overflow and foam out. That's what a great swelling word does. It just expands with time. So what these people will do is they'll speak great swelling words to you to try to seduce you into dropping your guard and believing what they really want you to believe. It's like double speak. That's what they do. That is what they are very good at doing. And so just understand that. Learn to recognize when someone is trying to speak great swelling words. And obviously the best thing that you can do is to always be reading the Bible because the more Bible that you have in you, the more the Holy Ghost is going to be able to reveal to your mind in those trying times and be able to pull those things in front of your eyes spiritually so that you're like, okay, wait a second here. Why do I have this red flag feeling about this person? Right, because a lot of times, right, I mean, God gave us our emotions and our feelings for a reason, right? And I made this statement before, and it's true. What you feel is real, but it's not always right or the right time. But the more that you align your thoughts and your hearts with the Word of God, the better you're going to be able to properly place people in your life, the better you're going to be able to discern what people are really trying to say to you. Because as a pastor, you guys don't see this all the time, but people are constantly saying great swelling words to me. Right? They're constantly saying things to me because they want something. They want me to change my doctrine or they're just, they just hate me. There are people that come to this church that do not like me on a regular basis. And it's just something I've had to just understand and realize it's just part of the job. It's just, there's nothing I'm ever going to be able to do about it. It's just the way that it is. But they'll constantly speak these great swelling words. And a lot of times I'll, it'll be like three days later, I'll be doing something just not even related to church. It'll be like mowing the lawn or something. And all of a sudden those words will just come in. And then I'll realize, oh, wait a second. That person's speaking great swelling words to me. Right. And what I do, you know, I just log it down. Nothing wrong with that. I write it down and I just keep tabs. Why? Because I want to protect my, myself. I want to protect my family, but I want to protect this church because those types of people, when they don't get right, when they don't change, they destroy. That's what they do. They destroy. Uh, go to second Peter chapter two, and we are going to wrap this thing up here. Now, the last part of that verse, while you're turning to second Peter two, I'm just going to mention, it says, Having men's person in admiration because of advantage. You need to be careful. You need to be careful about people that are fanboys or fangirls. Okay, these, look, we love them. We, we pray for them. But people that are just fans, that hold men's persons, that hold men in admiration because they have an advantage, right? The world does this all the time, right? The world looks at the celebrity, they look at the musician, they look at the athlete, and they say, wow, you know, that is, some, that is something I wish I could be. That is something that I, I'm going to strive to be. What they're doing is they're basically speaking, Jude, verse 16, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. When you start to see people in your life that are constantly holding other men 
uh, up higher than other people because they have some sort of advantage. You just need to be careful. You need to watch out for that. That's a problem. If that goes unchecked, those are people that will develop wings and start telling your secrets, start revealing information. Why? Because they don't care about the people around them. They don't care about the vision of the church or the vision of the organization. They just go out, flop their gums. They can't keep their traps shut. They can't keep their mouths shut and they wind up doing damage. That is what Jude is teaching here. You need to be careful and recognize those types of people in your life. Second Peter chapter two, like I said, we're just about done right here. Verse number 18. Another example of this, great swelling words, loaded words. Look at what it says. It says this, for when they, same type of people, okay? For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. So what this is saying is that people will come inside of a church and they're worldly and they want to drag people on their side or God forbid somebody's on fire for the Lord. They get frustrated. That leads to bitterness. And all of a sudden they're constantly coming to church, but they're bitter, right? And they start to become wanton. What does that mean? It means lacking. They start to look outside of the church. They start to look at the world and say, you know what, man, I want to be like that person. I want to just strive for that. And I want to get rich. And the Bible says, look, there's nothing wrong with having money. If God makes you rich, amen, praise God, let it be, right? But guess what? Most people can't handle it. And we shouldn't, and we're different. We're a royal priesthood, the Bible says. Right. And the Bible says that as a royal priesthood, our goal should not be to get rich. Right, it should be to serve God, get people saved, because your life is nothing but a vapor right. which vanishes away. Amen. And so these types of people here, they begin, they begin to become like lacking and, and wanton. And they start to want evil things. And what they'll do is they'll start to speak these great swelling words to other people in the congregation who maybe aren't as learned, maybe aren't as mature in the faith. And what they do, I've seen it so many times, is they just pull them into the little bubble, into their circle, and they get them evil affected towards the preaching, evil affected towards the brethren. And all of a sudden something happens and those people will take that guy aside and they're out of church and you have all these problems. We've been through it. This church has been through it. And you know what? That's why we have to constantly preach about these types of things to protect the flock, right? It's very important. Read the verse again. When they speak great swelling words of vanity, this is something you need to pay attention to. When someone's thoughts, the majority of what they say or are thinking is empty, it's vain. It's something that's not going to profit. Be careful. Watch out because here's what they'll often do. They allure through the lusts of the flesh through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in air. See, these types of people, they get filled with envy, right? And they start to look at other people who are like, you know what? I, I just want to be a disciple. I'm going to start reading the Bible every day. You know, I'm going to start memorizing. And they start getting on the right path, right? To be a disciple and to actually be used by God in a mighty way. And then these people who are lacking, these people who are bitter, they'll sit back and they'll say, man, I don't like that. And this is what they'll be thinking. And then guess what? That nonverbal communication comes out and they default to start and they'll just start speaking these great swelling words to try to get that individual under their wing. And they'll try to basically just destroy them, evil affect their minds. Next thing you know, like I said, you've got big, big trouble. And so we need to be careful with that. And so again, the bottom line is this. A few people that you meet in life can keep things confidential, right? And you need to realize that when God wants your secrets to come out, they're coming out. So sometimes we just need to realize Ecclesiastes 10 20, when we have these things that we want to keep private and they come out anyways, maybe, you know, you have to sometimes also just, just think maybe you didn't tell anybody. Maybe your thought life is in order, but God wants that to come out and it's going to come out. But just realize, don't get too casual with people, right? Get some discipline, discipline yourself. When someone's in your head, someone's on your nerves, so to speak, Get a plan mentally for those people because that is going to alleviate that boiling pressure that you feel. And it's going to make you more effective for Christ. It's going to put you in a leadership position because now you're mature. You're able to handle their attacks. You're able to handle their subtleties. And you never know when that might just turn somebody around. You might just turn that person into a friend. You might just be able to get that person on to the right path and realize these people like these tail bearers, they come and go. Look, just because we believe the Bible and we go so in, that doesn't mean they're not going to come in here. Okay. That doesn't mean that someone in here won't get bitter, won't get frustrated and become a tail bearer. Right. And, you, and another thing you just need to realize is that some people are hanging around with the wrong crowd. And what happens when you hang out with the wrong crowd? 
They evil affect your communication. They corrupt your manners. That's what the Bible teaches. You're not going to set them straight. They're going to set you crooked. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. So when you realize these things, look, it's going to help you out a lot, save you a lot of stress, a lot of unnecessary conflict. Because like I always say, we've got enough conflict just from the world, just from being Christian. You know, it, it, don't, it don't even matter what church you go to now. You tell somebody you're Christian, most of the time, especially if you go over to California, they're coming after you. You know, we live in cancel culture, right? You know, there's, there's a, a large part of society that wants to cancel us. I mean, there are groups of people that are going after anything that's even says Christ. They, they want it gone. They want it all gone, right? But guess what? We ain't going to let that happen. <laughs> Not going to let that happen. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for this great teaching in your word. Just pray you would help us to, to continuously grow and mature, Lord, that we may be, uh, may be able to discern those who are around us, Lord, and that we wouldn't be too casual in conversation and that we would constantly strive to make relationships better and save ourselves from frustration. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.